Welcome to The Outsider Philosopher. Um, those who have watched uh, my previous videos uh, may notice that I've changed uh, the name of the channel. It was The Humble Philosopher. I had chosen that for various reasons, but I definitely wasn't living up to the name as some astute commentators pointed out. Um, and that's true. At a certain level, one can't really be all that humble if they take themselves seriously on the subjects that thus far I've taken myself seriously on. So in fairness, uh, that's one reason for changing it. The other is that what I was trying to capture with the name, the humble philosopher was really what I'm, I think doing a better job with the name, the outsider philosopher. The outsider philosopher comes uh, from or is inspired by outsider art. Uh, so some of my favorite artists over the years have been outsider artists. Um, some have even been shut-ins, uh, as the case of uh, Henry Darger uh, from Chicago, uh, who created beautiful work over a lifetime that he created only for himself. And it was only really in like the last months of his lives that they were as they were moving him out of his apartment um, and into assisted living that they found this massive amount of artwork that he had done. Uh, really beautiful stuff. Anyways, um, just the idea being that, you know, sometimes there's value in a voice that's coming from the outside um, and then isn't weighed down by tradition. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the academic tradition isn't incredibly important. Um, but sometimes people can get so enmeshed in that that they can fail to see the proverbial forest for the trees. Uh, and so maybe coming from an outside perspective, um, just bringing sort of a personal process that I've had my entire life, maybe there are ways that I can make a contribution uh, coming in, in that uh, direction. And so case in point, uh, would be today, I would like to attempt to put more words on a definition of consciousness than have heretofore uh, been offered. So again, it's not a very humble thing to do. Um, and the problem, the hard problem of consciousness, what consciousness actually is, is so difficult that not only do we not have an understanding of what gives rise to consciousness, how consciousness works, but we really don't even have a definition of what consciousness is. Everything is just sort of like a tautology. We define consciousness by itself. Consciousness is awareness. What is awareness? Awareness is being conscious. So today, um, I'm going to offer a serious definition and not saying that it's right. It's just, you know, trying to be creative um, and see if perhaps there's something here to, to, to work with. And so I'll just throw out a definition of consciousness just from the start and then do what I do, which is just to try to set the context for where the thought came from so that I can explain the thought. Um, it's very, very difficult for me to formalize these things the way you would have to, you know, in an academic paper, you know, as part of being the outsider philosopher, you know, just because I don't have that skill set or just because I don't have that ability available to me doesn't necessarily mean that I don't have something to offer. And so the definition of con consciousness that I would put forth is that Consciousness is a point at which organized wave fronts converge. So just going to share my screen here to begin telling the story of where this idea came from. And so this is a book uh, I picked up at um, Borders back in the day when there were still Borders. And, you know, who knew, you know, we would miss a corporate chain of bookstores or who knew I would. Um, but I really do miss being able to walk into a Borders and just sort of walk through aisles of books and, you know, just be surrounded by the thought process. 
Uh, but it's called Time's Arrow and Archimedes Point. And it's a philosophical and physics um, exploration of the problem of the asymmetry of time. So in science, we would like things, apparently, to be as symmetrical as possible. Uh, we would like the equations to work forwards as well as backwards, to work left as well as right, up as well as down. And so everything in the first three dimensions is symmetrical. But when it comes to the fourth dimension, we have this feeling, at least, that time flows from the past into the future and that causes proceed effects and so this was just sort of um, an investigation into the arrow of time what might cause it what the solutions to it might be it was in reading this book that i came up with that idea for a definition of consciousness so this here is the uh, photo that I used for um, my thumbnail. And it's from Pixabay, and they ask you to give a shout out if you're going to use it to the creator. So his name is Kevin Schmid, and this is about as strong a shout out as I could give for Kevin Schmid. So go check out his stuff. Um, but here you see, uh, you know, a, a drop. Um, in a pond or in, in a puddle. Uh, and it creates these concentric circles that we're all familiar with. In reading uh, Time Zero and Archimedes Point, he gives a very solid uh, definition that anybody can see of what the problem of the asymmetry of time is, and it's radiation asymmetry. And so, you know, you're just thinking of a still surface of a pond, and you drop a pebble in the pond or a drop of water, and what do we get? We get these organized wave fronts moving away from that point of disturbance and radiating outwards. These wavefronts are called retarded wavefronts. The equations that govern these wavefronts, and they radiate from, um, you know, any, any point source that disturbs the environment radiates these concentric circles, these organized wavefronts that carry information about that initial disturbance. As a matter of fact, that's what holography is built on. If you were to drop a, a pebble into a bucket of water and freeze it, you could then break that up, take any piece from that, shine a laser through it, and get the image of that um, wave flowing through the water because it's carrying the information the initial contact is contained within that wave that's you know a, a very layman's uh, definition of holography but this is what I'm trying to get at here and please you know if you're watching this this is just my process. This is just the way I, I um, can get this information out. But you're seeing that here. I mean, this is actually probably the drop is already gone. And then you know how it the, you know, the water will eject another drop. But the whole idea here is these concentric waves that are radiating out. And those are organized. And they're called retarded waves. And the 
laws that govern this, the math that governs this, also allows for the inverse, which would be advanced waves. And that would be this definition that I offered at the beginning of organized wave fronts converging on a point. The thing is that everywhere you look in nature, everywhere you look in the universe, all you ever find are organized wave fronts radiating away from an emitter and never converging on an absorber. You can look and look and look and look everywhere in the outside world and you will never find, right? You're, you, if I wasn't to give you any context, if I wasn't to bias you on this image at all, you in your mind would know in which direction the image would flow. You would know intuitively that those circles would be propagating outwards and you would never expect for them to converge at that point. And so that's just your own instinctual knowledge of the arrow of time. And so there are different views on this as to what the cause is, whether this is a law that organized wave fronts can never converge on a point, or if it's just a statistical artifact that these outgoing waves are so much more likely than incoming waves that it's not that incoming waves are impossible, but it's just that you'll never see them. It's not for me to comment on that. But just accept to understand my idea here, the idea that you'll look and look and look and look and you will never find organized wavefronts converging on a point. You will find organized wavefronts passing over a point. You will find organized wavefronts disturbing other points that then will send out more organized wavefronts, but it's just like a radio antenna. We've all seen the old school, you know, from the 40s and the 50s, that beep, 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 and it's got those concentric circles and they're broadcasting out. And you might think, well, the radio antenna, they converge on the radio antenna. They do not. I think that's why they call them retarded is because when it, it um, interacts with that radio antenna, it bends what to that point would be a perfect circle. It's retarding that perfect circle and it's pushing on the radio antenna. And it's that signal, it's that back and forth that then creates the informational signal. And so just imagine that everywhere you look in space, you see these organized wave fronts spreading out. And if you can accept that that's what's always going on everywhere you look, you can get some real sense of the asymmetry of time and perhaps of the law of entropy. All right. So I was home reading that chapter um, and considering, you know, you know how it is when you get a new thought and it just sort of like it's settling in and you're like sort of kind of having an aha moment. Okay, now I can really see it. You're grokking something. People talk about grokking these days. I was like, all right, I'm grokking something there that this spreading out of information is the asymmetry of time. So after reading that chapter, I left my apartment and this is in Chicago and I'm going for a walk and I come up on a street corner and there's a stop sign. And I look at the stop sign and it's like, the stop sign is looking at me. And this is where my idea that a possible definition or perhaps some way to bring consciousness into better focus is this idea that 
Consciousness is a point at which organized wave fronts converge, right? Everywhere you look out in the physical universe, organized wave fronts are radiating away from a point. And never will you find the inverse where they're coming together, except here I am, I'm looking at a stop sign, and the stop sign is pointed at me. And I think this is where it's now helpful to understand that the only access to the idea to, to consciousness that we have is our own consciousness. And that there's this one that is having this experience. And it's actually part of one of the real difficulties of consciousness and also the real magic of consciousness, the way the consciousness itself transcends what we understand about physical laws. I'll explain. There is something known as the binding problem in consciousness. So imagine that you're watching a red ball rolling to the right. That is one object for you in your experience, a red ball rolling to the right. But the various aspects of the description of that object take place in disparate parts of your brain. The motion, one part, the direction, another part, the color red in another part, the material that the ball is made of, whether that be that it's made of, you know, rubber, it's a red rubber ball, or it's like a hard um, pool ball. The memory of that ball, whether that's a new ball to you, or that's your favorite ball that you've had since you were a kid, all these take place in disparate parts of the brain that are in some cases separated from each other by several inches. And an inch is classical space. That's way above the quantum realm. So how is it that the various aspects of that red ball can find their way into one unified how can they be bound, it's the binding problem, into one experience that is that red ball? So, to understand where I'm going with this, take very seriously, take as very real, take as needing explanation your actual experience, your lived experience of any object, such as this stop sign that I see. And I think the stop sign is helpful because it's also not just an object, but it's conveying information to me. It's conveying knowledge. It has a meaningful dimension to it. And so in my conscious experience, here is this thing, this stop sign, that is pointed directly at me. And as far as my conscious experience goes, it's almost like the stop sign shoots towards me and stops and resolves within me, within this one thing that is I. The Vedantists talk about this I. It's talked about many other places too. It's at the root, but you know, Vedana, one of the things I love about Vedanta is they, they go beyond just consciousness and awareness, and they talk about the self with a capital S. And we get that confused in the West because we think of the self with the lowercase s that has more to do with the personality and the individual. But they don't lose the importance of that individuality, that sacredness, by then just appealing to something abstract like consciousness, they keep it as the self, but it's that one thing. So, here I am, I have this stop sign that's pointed at me. I've just read this 
chapter about how organized wavefronts only in the physical world radiate away from a point they're organized and so they're carrying information and so information is always traveling away from things it's never traveling it never resolves in things it passes over things it disturbs things but that's that retarded wave it's not the advanced wave where the entire wave resolves in one point. And yet, here's this stop sign that's shooting at me and is resolving in me. Meaning that, and this is in my conscious experience, like forget, you know, the physical arguments. I understand that this is a piece of metal uh, that it's shining light at me, that it's sending vibrations of sound towards me, that it's reflecting heat in my direction, that this is all passing into to my body and through me. That's not the salient point. The salient point is that in my conscious experience, I have a stop sign and it's stopness, it's word, goes as far as me and no further and stops, which means it resolves. And if it's coming towards me and I can understand it, it's intelligible to me, then it must be organized. And so I have an organized wave front that's coming towards me and is stopping within me, which is complete resolution. That stop sign does not zoom beyond me. It's whatever physical manifestation, whatever its material reality is, sure, it's all spreading out. Remember, everything's spreading out in material reality. In my conscious experience, those you know, whatever my conscious equivalency of light is, those light waves I'm seeing are coming into my consciousness as organized wave fronts, and they are completely converging and resolving and ending in me. As a conscious object, that stop sign goes no further than me just as would have to be the case if it were possible in physical reality to reverse the concentric waves that come from a raindrop in a still pond. If we could ever observe that, those, it, it's, you get what I'm saying? Those waves, it's not just that the waves come into the point, but they go no further than the point. When they're retarded, it's because one edge, one side touches, and that changes the shape of the wave, and it passes over, and then the point that it touches then emanates more of these circles. But all the wave energy would have to con converge to that point and then disappear. That's why it's either impossible or so extraordinary unlikely that you never see it. And yet, your conscious experience is the exact inverse of that either, we'll just call it a law. Let's just, you know, I'm not here to argue about um, the truth of the physical side of it. All I'm doing is observing that here's this thing that we can never find in nature that in our conscious experience is the exact inverse. Here's another way of thinking about it. When you look at your cell phone, what do you do? You point that cell phone at yourself. When you put on a pair of virtual reality goggles, 
what is the entirety of the virtual reality world built around? Right? It's math. It's computer programming. You could look at those ones and zeros. You could look at that computer programming and you could understand it abstractly, but you wouldn't truly get it if you didn't realize that all that computer programming is organized around, it's organized around the idea of a conscious one in the middle. It is the geometry of the inside of a sphere, which means that everything in a virtual reality setting in the virtual reality program itself in the math itself is organized around an idea of organized wave fronts have to be organized because it's information if they were disorganized they couldn't carry information organized wave fronts converging on a conscious point at which that information is resolved and gains its meaning So, that's the idea. Consciousness is a point at which organized wave fronts converge. And I would say probably would then be that point itself. And this would... Perhaps it would solve the binding problem because you have all this information now that has become this one point. I think it would be, it would share certain similarities to a black hole, meaning that beyond a certain point, you know, the event horizon or whatever, mathematics itself would break down because it, the, the whole thing would skew to infinity. Right. That's why, you know, even if it's just a statistical anomaly that you never see it in nature, the perfection of that math to get all those circles to then all those waves to then perfectly resolve at one point would be, you know, just infinitely unlikely. But here you have two of the problems of consciousness. One is you have the binding problem. You have all that information becoming bound into one thing. And you have the infinity problem where, you know, the math would go to infinity. But that, and I've argued this in other videos, is what consciousness is. It's why Donald Hoffman's work is off and comes to the absurd conclusions that it does because he's running models that assume that the thing to be explained, you or I, is a closed off finite system where you and I are not. We are constrained infinities. We are nested infinities. We are a lower order but still infinite being. And the reason why you know that you're infinite is because you have feelings. You have qualia. That's why everybody wants to get rid of quality. Oh, it's this qualia stuff. Well, it's because you can't represent it in finite math. It's not substrate independent. Qualia is only possible in an infinite substrate. This is where you have to then understand the innate meaning of Gödel's incompleteness theorems because math can't get you there. You have to understand because math can't get you there, it's infinite. You can't program feeling into a machine because in machine world, in machine language, in mathematics, meaning is an infinite regress because nothing can stand in as the final authority. The final authority is always one step away. That's Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It just goes off into infinity. So conscious beings are infinite or at least have access to the infinite. And so you would have those waves converging. And I think you would have a very similar problem mathematically to uh, 
models of black holes where at a certain point the math just breaks down because it it becomes an infinity it just and again if you were to think about how virtual reality is modeled virtual reality is actually modeled around this very assumption that you're looking at the inside of a spherical world where all information is pointing towards you and we only know that virtual reality is successful in what it's trying to do if you can plug an infinite one into it that says oh yeah i saw the stars i saw spaceships i saw you know whatever it is that you see right the math in and of itself isn't going to get you there you have to have that infinite one in the middle and you're literally, you know, I mean, you know, just to point out how actual this could be, because you have entire industries around this very idea that is the inverse of what we can actually see in the world, which is nowhere in the world do we see organized wavefronts coming in, coming in, coming up, and resolving, except in conscious experience. And I've always had this intuitive feeling that there's some relationship between consciousness and time itself. And so here you have a definition of what consciousness could be that would also balance the asymmetry of time. Because if you just accept that the asymmetry of time is radiative, radiation asymmetry, right, that is the asymmetry of time organized wavefronts always spreading out and never converging. And now you see that a consciousness is a point at which organized wavefronts converge. Perhaps that's the balance. Perhaps that's the, the symmetry that we insist should exist. It actually does, but it's so. The outsider philosopher. It's just an idea. But, you know, I can't help but think it tracks. I know it's my idea and, you know. But accept for a moment just your conscious experience being the only real thing. Your conscious experience is only being the real thing. People say, well, it's an illusion. But if it's truth is an illusion, then it's truth. Like, I'm not trying to push that part too far, but to help you think about it, it's like, but well, this is an illusion, that's an illusion. No, something's an illusion if you can only then show the truth beneath it. But there is some lived experience of, you know, let's just say it's all math, fine that math has a dimension to it that's not math, that's the lived experience. And so I'm just asking you to take your own, you know, just look around you, wherever you are, just look around you. Isn't everything pointed at you? And even if that is an illusion, isn't that illusion completely built on the idea of everything pointed at you? And so isn't everything pointed at you? Because you can see everything, look around, everything makes sense to some degree. So it has to be organized, it has to be carrying information, and it has to be resolving in you because it goes no further than you. And that would be the absolute inverse of the problem that you see out there where everything is always spreading out. All right. I don't know. This is just a message in a bottle. I just keep hoping that, you know, somebody will stumble along this that sees it and A, you know, that I'm right. There's no guarantee that I'm right. Um, but B, then would have the mathematical chops to formalize that. So thank you for clicking on this. And if you have a moment, please like, comment, and subscribe.